<coughs> Dear colleagues, we welcome you to our webinar on feminine organized by the IPA website editorial board. Thank you for being so many to participate. If men founded IPA 110 years ago, upon the shoulders of Freud, women have made major clinical contributions, theoretical and institutional, and have given leadership to psychoanalysis. Cultural norms vary a lot on what is considered feminine. Though society could expect psychoanalysis to provide a definition, Freud's position is clear. Here, our material becomes much more obsolete and incomplete. Thus, in his work, the feminine takes various forms. It is due to an unknown characteristic that even anatomy cannot grasp. In this place, we meet only equivalences whose approximate and inadequate character is pattern. The feminine is not easily definable, and this very character pushes the construction of the subjective position. Freud says it is up to psychoanalysis not to describe what a woman is, this is an unworkable task, but to look for how the child with psychosexual tendencies becomes a woman. Since then, women psychoanalysts have tried to clarify the feminine, and they still do. They have differentiated psychic functions from qualities, maternity and maternal, femininity and feminine. And we will still continue the elaboration during the IPA Congress in London this summer. We have invited and have the pleasure to have with us today three, three proeminent psychoanalysts. Rosine Perlberg for Europe, Clara Nemas from Latin America, and Harriet Wolf from North America. But before introducing them to you, I will give you some organizational informations. As usual, the webinar will be divided in two parts. During the first slot, for 55 minutes, our panelists will present us a variety of perspectives on the feminine over time and focus on the femininity today in its private and public dimensions of its existence. It will be a question of updating the forms of a relationship with oneself and the world and even the IPA world. During the second slot, the question and answer sessions, it is you, attendees. You can ask your question and our guests will answer and discuss as many as possible. Already during the presentations, you can post your questions. For doing so, please post your question in the question pane on the right hand side of your screen. You have to go to the questions line. There is a small white arrow that precedes the word question. Click on it to open the question box, type your question and send it. During the discussion, we will try to send you in your chat box the question asked and you could read them in the, it is below the question box. And now, let me introduce you our first guest, Rosine Perlberg, PhD in social anthropology, training analyst and president-elect of the British Psychoanalytic Society, visiting professor in the psychoanalysis unit at University College London, and corresponding member of the Paris Psychoanalytical Society. Rosine, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored to share this webinar with my esteemed colleagues, Harriet Wolf and Clara Nemas. The feminine appears as multifaceted, a multifaceted picture in Freud's work. 
It emerges in the clinical accounts of his understanding of hysteria, of which Dora's treatment is perhaps the most famous. It is present in the discovery of the pre phase, in his formulation of the feminine identifications in both male and female patients, and ultimately in the, his idea the that the feminine is what is repudiated in both sexes. There is also the Gradiva, the most feminine woman of the Freudian oeuvre, in the words of Monique Cornu. From early on, Freud equated the feminine with the object of psychoanalytic investigations when he stated, and I quote, it is to be suspected that the essentially repressed element is always what is feminine, unquote. If the boy's development appears to be the model for Freud's understanding of sexuality and the Oedipus complex, it is the feminine and the woman that appears to challenge Freud's thinking in many other texts, such as a child is being beaten, the economic problem of masochism, and the uncanny. Freud maintained that the psychic reality of sex had to be distinguished from the anatomical reality. Initially, however, Freud assumed symmetry in the development of what he called the Oedipus complex. Boys love their mothers and have rivalrous and murderous feelings toward their fathers. Girls desire their fathers and are jealous of their mothers. At that point, Freud was still a vulgar empiricist, in the words of Laplanche. In an essay written in 1924, Freud distinguished between the psychosexual history of boys and that of girls. Now, Freud recognized the importance of the pre phase in which boys and girls have both feminine and masculine attributes. During this initial stage, bisexuality is characteristic of both sexes. What is it then that is repressed in the Oedipal phase? In the main body of his work, Freud oscillated between two hypotheses. According to the first, the nucleus of the unconscious of what is repressed is the side that belongs to the opposite sex. According to the second hypothesis, both sexes repudiate femininity, a phenomenon that is an essential element of the asymmetry between the sexes. This repudiation is, Freud suggests, the bedrock of psychoanalysis and part of the great riddle of sex. This is a mysterious statement that has been source of much debate. Some authors have suggested that the repudiation of femininity is a repudiation of the child's position of helplessness in relation to the mother. André Green has suggested the distinction between passivity and passivation. The latter represents a position of receptivity in relation to maternal care. He sees it as a crucial requirement in the analytic process. And I quote, now the psychoanalytic cure is not possible without this confident passivation where the analysand gives himself to the analyst's care in a transformation of the way the baby trusts the mother's care. Although one can suggest that the interplay between masculine and feminine identifications is present in each of Freud's cases, it is in the case of the Wolfman that the specific link between the fluidity of identifications in connection with the primal scene is made most explicit. In a way, Freud believed believe that the Wolfman's madness was indeed his bisexuality. A certain degree of fluidity between masculine and feminine identifications is, however, necessary to psychic development and is a universal human characteristic. It is what characterizes psychic bisexuality, in the words of Christian David, in contrast with a fantasy of being bisexual that corresponds to a phallic position and a denial of difference. 
In many ways, one could suggest that Freud was the first queer theoretician. In 1974, Juliette Mitchell, in her groundbreaking book, emphasized that Freud's understanding of women in patriarchal structures, he was understanding it and not endorsing it. And I quote, psychoanalysis is not a recommendation for patriarchal society, but an analysis of one. In Mitchell's words, and I quote, the selection of the phallus as the mark around which subjectivity and sexuality are constructed reveals precisely that they are constructed in a division which is both arbitrary and alienating. End of quote. The differentiation between man and woman is thus the result of a long process that is never complete in that pure masculinity or pure femininity or never to be found. Klein brings an important contribution to the understanding of pre oedipal femininity when she maintains the centrality of the inner world in the girl's development. Klein postulates an innate unconscious knowledge of the vagina. Nowadays, I think most analysts would accept this idea although I would see it more in terms of Bion's notion of pre a preconception, a weight and realization, where the role of experience is crucial in activating unconscious knowledge. Kristeva describes the pre oedipo as a play of bodily rhythms and pre-linguistic exchanges between infant and mother. It is a domain of the semiotic. With the Oedipus complex, the symbolic, the domain of unified texts, cultural representations, and knowledge is dominant. In the writings of the French feminists, there is a profound search for the multiplicity that characterizes femininity, uh, which may be expressed in a language that itself, itself attempts to capture the feminine. Paradoxically, when is referred back to Freud thinking about hysteria. The symptoms of the first patient of psychoanalysis and O included mutism, paralysis, time missing, and gaps of memory, all expressive of interruptions in the domain of reality that is being denied. Psychoanalysis indicates that sexuality is created through division and discontinuity although the feminine is the side that both represents and tends to be represented as the negative of masculinity. Laplanche has coined the term le sexuel, by definition multiple and polymorphous, which refers to infantile, perverse sexuality. He stresses that the sexuel is the psychoanalytic object, always precarious, until the upheaval of puberty, when the instinctive genital will have to come to terms with it. He argues that the introduction to psychoanalysis of the term gender colludes with, the, with those who want to diminish the impact of the Freudian theory, Freudian discovery. If from its beginning, psychoanalysis emphasized the notion of bisexuality and was concerned with the enigma of the differences between the sexes, this issue has also been central to social anthropology. All societies are faced with the task of, di of differentiating between the identical and the different. The division of gender roles according to sex is universal. It is present in all human societies. Making sense of it is a task perhaps a lifelong one, for each individual. According to Héritier, the differences between male and female bodies and between their roles in reproduction are at the base of all systems of representation and especially beliefs about difference, such as hot, cold, dry, humid, high, low, inferior, superior, light, dark, and so forth. Binary systems, she adds, are at the base of universal categorizations. Héritier addresses the universal surrounding the notions of masculine and feminine 
in a variety of kinship systems, as well as in the cultural images that are present in these differentiations. These are constructs of the culture, not biological given. Each known society attempts, however, to find its own solutions and responses to the fundamental enigma of these differences through the structures of kinship systems and rituals. An example is that of the Navan ritual among the Yatmu pe people of New Guinea, in which men dress as women and women dress as men. Bateson's analysis of the ceremony is one of the most fascinating illustrations to my mind in the anthropological literature of a response that each culture offers to the enigma of the difference between the sexes. In the context of the Yatmu society, this refers to the question of what is transmitted through the mother's side and what comes from the father and the origins of the differentiation between masculine and feminine. Now, how does the feminine express itself in clinical practice? Monique and Jean Cournu have referred to a type of transference that emerges in the analysis of women as an archaic memory of a maternal imago that gives the impression that the analytic work meets dead bodies, the leftovers of a deadly battle. I think that their descriptions put us in contact with the feminine repressed. Monique Cornu has distinguished between the feminine and femininity. Femininity is what the woman displays, attractive in her finery, makeup, everything that makes her beautiful, and deflects the gaze from the genital organs. Womanliness as a masquerade, in the words of Jean Riviere. Femininity displayed through the whole body is what, is what is first encountered by the male hiding the female organ, sign of castration, and the feminine that would lead him to flee an anxiety. The encounter with the feminine in an analysis may be a voyage into that which characterizes the unconscious itself, disruption, discontinuity, incoherence, in the words of Abraham and, and Torok. In a series of papers, I have suggested that the transference to a female analyst allows for an identification with a primitive maternal imago to explode more vividly into the transference. The internalization of the, the body of the mother can take on frightening, fragmented qualities. The mother's body and sexuality need to be kept at bay while at the same time preserved in oneself. The somatic experiences tend to be expressed in fragmented part object terms so that what emerges in the analysis of bodily parts, such as the breasts, the uterus, ovaries, and anus. An image of submersion in the maternal body or maternal waters is that of an endless orgasm. I have also suggested that in the analysis of women by women, one may be able to identify in the female patient an attachment to the primary lost object that is preserved in a melancholic, invisible way, the longing to which it is connected might only reach representation in the après coup of the analytic process. One may then identify the links between this primary love, melancholia, and the feminine unrepresentable in the analysis of women, representation that it's reached only through the vicissitudes of the transference and counter-transference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosine, for this uh, clear presentation of the way in which uh, feminine emerges in the course of the analytic encounter, as well in the course of the psychoanalysis developments and diversity. And now, uh, now Clara Nemas. Clara Nemas is a training analyst of the Buenos Aires Psychoanalytic Association. 
member of the IPA China Committee and of the Asia Pacific Planning Committee. She was vice president and scientific secretary of the Buenos Aires Psychoanalytic Association. Clara, please. Okay. I am really very happy to share this webinar with you and with my colleagues, Harriet Wolf and Rosine Perelberg. And I would like to start this um, presentation with two quotes. One by Freud in 1933, where he ends more or less his uh, lecture say, on the feminine, saying, we must not overlook the fact that an individual woman may be a womanly being in other respects as well. And the other from a little boy coming back from school said, I told my friends today at school that we should allow girls to play with us. After all, they are also human beings. So the term feminine is charged with meaning in psychoanalysis and opens up infinite paths of approach from Freud to our day. In his last lecture on this subject, Freud begins with ideas which could be considered contemporary, but his conclusions, as we know, have provoked heated discussions and dissent among his colleagues. Today, I would like to talk about the contribution to the understanding of the feminine in the part of the world I live in, the Rio de la Plata region. This is not only because I am a member of this culture, but also because I think Argentinian psychoanalysis marked the tradition in the development of psychoanalytic thinking in South America, influencing different aspects of culture, education and health. The shift in the conception of the feminine in different, different historical contexts presents an epochal challenge to our theories. Even in Freud's time, in the year that he wrote his last contribution on the feminine, the tensions around the feminine were very present, not only inside the psychoanalytic movement, but in the society in general. I would like to, to present here the developments in the life of Anna O. Bertha Pappenheim, which was the real name of the famous patient, the first case in the canon of psychoanalytic literature that opens Breuer and Freud's studies on hysteria. Pappenheim was the founder of Jewish feminism in Germany, who became internationally recognized for her work. So both psychoanalysis and feminism were, in its beginnings, unified in the life of one woman. In Argentina, the effects of the violent and repressive military dictatorship of the 1970s, which we are remembering not today, on the March the 24th, an anniversary, and we remember it by a day of um, commemorating memory, justice, and uh, truth. So uh, in the 70s, the, the effect on, a, on society as a whole were paramount, I think, for accounting for the upsurge of studies on the feminine. Following the dark years of repression, critical reflection on feminine subjectivity took place in the local psychology milieu, which had been very strongly influenced by psychoanalysis. The innovative ideas proposed by these researchers took their place in an intersection with the field of studies of feminism. As I said before, in Argentina, the area of mental health was influenced and transformed by psychoanalytic ideas. Clinical presentations, which were regarded as typical of women, were understood not only as a failed and symptomatic response, but also as a rebellion against the social devaluation of women in society. An Argentinian analyst, Emil Cedillo Bleichmar, referred to it as the spontaneous feminism of the hysteric, which is the name, the title of one of her books. 
Also important in Argentina was Simone de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, published in 1949. It is considered as one of the earliest attempts to confront human history from a feminine perspective. Its publication marks the place in history where an enlightenment regarding the feminine begins. So now I will talk about Leticia Glosser, who is also an Argentinian contemporary Argentinian analyst, who specialized in the subject of femininity, worked on the deconstruction of the feminine position established by the culture from the perspective of the paradigm of a complex thinking which implies complex logic. Binary thinking, according to her, has brought the construction of the idea of the woman as the other, a notion that needs to be reconsidered from the perspective of diversity, no otherness. Coming back to the Rio de la Plata region, I shall refer only to two of the many women analysts who devoted themselves to the subject of the feminine. As for reasons of time, I cannot do justice to all who made so valuable contributions in the field. I shall start with Marie Langer, one of the pioneer founders of psychoanalysis in Argentina, who in 1951 published a seminal book entitled Maternity and Sex, Psychoanalytic and Psychosomatic Studies. Her life story is fascinating. She was born in Vienna in 1910, where she did her psychoanalytic training at the Institute of Psychoanalysis. When Hitler came to power, she was already a member of the Communist Party and went to Spain as doctor to fight in the civil war as part of the International Brigade. In 1942, she was one of the founders and later became president of Argentine Psychoanalytic Association, <clears throat> from which she resigned in 1969, and then she went in exile uh, to, to exile in Mexico no, after the coup. She died in 1987, but remained a very influential and respected figure until the end. Langer's book, Central Theme, is Maternity and Maternal Instinct but mostly it deals with infertility and fails form, forms of maternity that expose how is it possible to not be truly a mother, even if a woman gives, gives birth and brings up a child. In a revision of Freud's conception of the feminine, the author considers that Freud overvalued the biological or over social and cultural factors, which he considers decisive. The true realization for a woman, she says at the time, comes from maternity, but she also says that women may be allowed by society to sublimate their maternal instinct and develop full life. Years later, Mary Langer went back to her book and disagreed with some of her earliest, earlier expressions. She changed her earlier views and proposed that the wish or the need to become a mother is something constructed and not natural. These conceptions opens the possibility for women and men to decide not to have children. Following these lines, in current developments about maternity, Patricia Alcolombre, who is a colleague from the Argentine Association, considers the subject of maternity and paternity in times of assisted pregnancy and differentiates the wish for a child in men and women for the passion for a child at all costs, even under severe risks to the health of the mother. Now we go to another influential Argentinian psychoanalyst, Mariam Alisade, who died in 2013, and who devoted most of her work to exploring the universe of the feminine. She was very active in the formation of COAP and eventually became its president. Miriam Mariam wrote profusely and edited books, many, on the subject. 
There are so many perspectives from where to approach Maria Malisade's contribution to the feminine, impossible to encompass in this limited time, so I chose just one. The difference she establishes between phallic power and feminine power. I do so because it has links with some personal proposals I would like to develop later. In brief, phallic power in men and women is a universal tendency aimed at suppressing anxieties relating to feelings of annihilation and impotence. At times, phallic power may be allied with destructiveness by making promises of narcissistic gratifications. Women may wish for phallic power to compensate for their submission to gender roles that confine them to the private sphere with no social recognition. This can be achieved directly or through association with someone who has the longed for phallic power in the form of money or social status. When Alisade describes feminine power, again present in men and women, she characterizes it as accepting vulnerability, limitations and the transience of life. She thinks that feminine power opens the possibility for non-conventional power, a kind of non-coercive power. This form of power exercised by men and women traversed by the feminine promotes what the author calls tertiary narcissism. This form of narcissism is directed towards the social with its, with its accompanying qualities of solidarity recognizing human helplessness and the transient nature of existence. The recognition of helplessness is a strong source of moral motiv motivation, as Freud said. It implies the knowledge of the depths of our dependence on others. This perspective, according to Alisade, may produce what she calls a feminization of the culture a dimension which is not easy to understand as it is alien to conventional logic. I shall link this concept of feminine power to my ideas about the difference between courage and valor. But before I do so, I would like to refer briefly to another Argentinian thinker, an anthropologist, who has made important contributions to the concept of the feminine. Rita Segato has developed interesting ideas around the motives, motives to sustain patriarchy and the conception of the feminine as the other of the universal one. No? If you have another, you have a universal one. Segato thinks that the way forward in history will involve affirming community and its bonds on rooted, rootedness, which she relates, relates to the feminine. She speaks about the need to recover the time where the domestic sphere and its forms of interpersonal and intercorporeal contact have not been displaced and foreclosed by the emergence of the public sphere and the state, which is masculine genealogy. She describes two distinctive types of historical projects, the projects of things and the project of bonds. The historical project of things produces individuals. The historical project of bonds produ produces community. She links the second to the feminine, and, the and I find close links between this concept of the project of bonds and Marine Alizade concept of feminine power. I would like, now like to include some reflections about two concepts which refer to a particular aspect of femininity. In a paper entitled On the Courage to Analyze and Be Analyzed, I differentiate the characteristics of two concepts that may be used sometimes as synonyms. These concepts are courage and valor. I consider valor to be the emotional quality of phallic power related to achieving goals. Facing the challenge linked to the Oedipal struggle, struggling for success, winning wars, and obtaining trophies. The forms these laurels take 
in concrete and symbolic forms vary according to the time in history and cultural context. On the other hand, I think of courage as a feminine quality, constant and sustained over time. Its opposite is not cowardice, cowardice but giving up on the children's upbringing or its equivalent in long projects with uncertain outcome. To sustain a long-term project over time, such as a child's upbringing of an or an analysis, a large dose of confidence and hope is needed to enable us to face not only the dangers which might or not, might not be present, but also the consequences of our decisions. We need also courage to admit our wish to destroy something that is worth destroying. Echigoyen warns us that envy is, is evidenced in a good analysis that goes through the working through of the depressive position. Since it is the good object and not the idealized object, one that is intolerable for the destructive aspects of the mind. Beyond tells us that just as we are capable of being parents, we are also vulnerable to the forces that would destroy what creative parents or potentially creative parents could create. And he goes on to say, we have to get used to being members of that particular group of culture, group or culture, but we cannot get used to it if we have not the courage to exist in it. Therefore, we need courage to admit both our creative potential and our destructivity towards it. I think that sustaining this conflict, not necessarily resolving it, is a task that we face over and over in our developmental road, in all aspects of our life. When speaking of courage, we all certainly evoke shared and private images. Two of the scenes that come to my mind most clearly have to do with the strength of the courage of the weak and even the defeated. One is the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto, together with the first verse of its hymn, never say you are on your last road. The other scene, which perhaps influenced me at first to think of courage as a maternal quality, are the mothers and grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, our modern Antigonas, who persisted in knowing what had happened to their disappeared children, sometimes just to be able to bury them. Or the plight of the grandmothers who fought to recover their grandchildren abducted by the military dictatorship of the 70s, knowing that some of them would certainly die of old age before they succeeded in their fight. So I feel and hope that these concepts may contribute to our understanding of the feminine, as courage is such an important quality of the feminine, not, even, not often recognized or understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clara, for this so original conception of feminine power and of uh, courage being the ultimate feminine quality. And now, Harriet Wolf. Harriet Wolf is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. She is a training analyst at the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis and the immediate past president of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Harriet, please. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you. It's a privilege to join you, our visitors, and also my colleagues, Rosine Perlberg, Clara Namas, and Elena, Elena, Eliana Milona. And to have the opportunity to talk with you about the feminine and my interest in it related to leadership. There tends to be a conflation of female and feminine, which does not serve us well. In my view, the capacities called feminine are exactly what are needed by both men and women if they are to succeed as leaders in democratic, collaborative, 
forward-looking organizations. I participated last fall on a panel at the Latin American Psychoanalytic Federation, FEPAL's concert, conference. The topic was femininity today, still a dark continent? The dark continent was Freud's 1926 conception of female psychology as impenetrable. It reflected an anatomical approach to women whose lack of a penis was seen as eased only by the capacity to bear a child. Anyone who listens to women today knows they have a lot to say about who they are and what they have, not what they are not. But as with so many of Freud's propositions, he articulated something deeply true about human psychology as it plays out in the social realm. Over 90 years ago, he reflected an enduring social dynamic that places women in a less than or lacking position. Current social evidence includes women's relative failure to advance in business, the arts, and in academics. Women experience lower levels of appointment, lower salaries, and the phenomenon of the glass ceiling. The perception of women as enigmatic, or more importantly, as frightening, foreign, or other, remains a powerful and largely unconscious dynamic in many Western cultures. This dynamic underlies the backlash that women in leadership positions often experience. The social science literature describes the double bind they face. Women must be assertive if they are to lead, but that behavior contradicts the expectation of communal feminine behavior. A problem can arise when a woman proves that the assumption she is unable to be aggressive, decisive, and calm is wrong, when she challenges a dominant male social hierarchy by behaving as she must in order to be effective. The Me Too movement in the United States and elsewhere represents the quest for a clear articulation within civil society that domination and subjugation cause real damage and have to go. In this regard, feminism is a social movement that transcends women. It touches the part of the human psyche that struggles to find a voice against whatever forces are mustered against it. As psychoanalysts, we see evidence of accommodation to psychic struggle that surpasses gender. For example, Winnicott describes the defensive effort to survive through the false self. The struggle against adversity is found too in the marginalized thoughts relegated long ago to the corners of the psyche that have not been symbolized, but relate to early maternal care, what Bolas calls the unthought known. To be authentic, true to oneself, open and affirming, requires another who is willing to listen. In general, men and women in psychoanalysis have been a societal exception in their open attitude to women leaders. The IPA has its first woman president, Virginia Ungar, and we have a long tradition of female thought leaders. But it takes a society ready to listen before a real synergy emerges to the collective betterment of all. In my view, one cannot talk about truth unless there is first a voice and secondly, an other receptive to hearing and acknowledgement. Psychoanalysts' early views of female and feminine emerged in an era when biology was considered destiny. The notion of an other who is receptive to hearing as essential to human development came later. Despite Freud's early radical clinical openness to the truth of women's experience, as he encountered hysterical pathology and facilitated women's associative discovery of the source of their pain, his theoretical views of female psychology remained incomplete. Females remained defined by their anatomical difference, what they lacked compared to males. Psychoanalytic theory building took a turn away from the binary or male-centric point of view, later through such theorists as Janine Chascus Mergel and Emil C. Dio Bleichmar. In Shashkush Mirgel's paper, 
Freud and female sexuality, the consideration of some blind spots in the exploration of the dark continent. The considerate, she articulates a universal pre oedipal human fear of helplessness. She anchors the normal defensive tendency to demean the mother or first caregiver in the profound power that that caregiver, caregiver has physically and psychologically over a person's development. 20 years later, Dio Bleichmar began to write about the intersubjective field that defines a child's experience of self and the degree to which he or she feels feminine, masculine, or a mix of the two. She builds on the work of Laplanche and his notion of gender as plural, not binary, and on Moni and his research with children who had received a false gender assignment at birth and were then reassigned, which created a traumatic and virtually impossible psychic shift for the parents. Dio Bleichmar articulates the role of relationship in representation. She writes, what is formulated as the social construction of gender refers to the constant intersubjective exchange, to the conscious and unconscious representation of the mother and father, of the feminine or masculine that are part of their modalities, of their personalities, and the way in which each member of the couple relates to the other. Femininity is not defined by gender. It's a set of capacities that are innate in young boys as well as girls. Gilligan defines femininity as a person's being decidedly direct, attentive, articulate and authentic, relationally attuned and perceptive, empathic and intuitive. She argues that it's present but then lost in both girls and boys, but at different developmental stages. Early formative relationships with adults who represent the strengths of a feminine attitude are important to both male and female development, to one's enduring capacity to retain a feminine attitude. The feminine defines a space to grow and be, to be nurtured, protected, and evolved in one's own terms. Vivian Chatrivatin refers to this as a matricial space in which the analyst, like the infant's primary caregiver, has the ethical responsibility to recognize the otherness of the other, the not me. The stance is exactly what is needed by both men and women to successfully lead psychoanalytic organizations because the very values of responsibility and caring affirm the value of psychoanalysis and enable its constructive reach into the world. I view organizational leadership as a direct extension of the ethical stance of the analyst in the responsive and responsible matricial caring for a patient. As clinical analysts, we give light to that dark continent aspect of self that goes unrecognized or is suppressed. Preserving the psychoanalytic encounter with as much intensity or continuity as possible is a vital act of caring and a feminine way of conceptualizing analytic process. It also serves as an ethical platform for leadership. Leadership means attending to the dark continent aspect of an organization, the unarticulated and often unrepresented within it. We must be sensitive to what voices are not being heard and how our ideologies that make us feel certain might bl also blind us to important truths. Beyond suggested that truth is essential for psychic growth, and this likely applies to organizations of, as well. Of course, there's no sure way to know truth, especially in an organization as broad and diverse as the IPA. Nonetheless, there is a way of building consensus by thoroughly acknowledging what is conflictive, uncomfortable, hard to face and divisive. This takes patience and endurance. There is something very matricial then about leadership. Consensus is a form of truth in organizations and consensus evolves when leaders make the space and time for it to emerge. Staying with Beyond for the moment, 
he offers a further parallel between leadership and the psychoanalytic encounter. I'm thinking of his counsel that the analysts listen without memory or desire. Decision-making is an intricate process in organizations. It concerns much more than a vote. Bion would have been very aware that the analyst's subjectivity is an inevitable part of the field. As such, we come saturated with memory and desire. It stirs within us. His advice was aimed not at prescribing an impossibility, but of holding the other's welfare separately as a fundamental ethic, clearing our mind, and by so doing, increasing permeability so that we can hear what is novel and yet to be said. The transformative aspect of leadership is fundamental to my understanding. It's what I mean about receptivity and its relation to the feminine. I don't view leadership as a take charge, impose one's will enterprise. At the same time, there's something vital about having a vision of what would be best for the organization and how one would like to influence and inspire. But implementation of a vision is a theory of technique, more than one of achieving specific aims or goals. It's about process and not specific outcome. It requires a keen appreciation for differences and a capacity to reach into the corners of the organization to represent those voices least likely to be heard. A leader needs to hold the organization with a benign, attentive, active receptivity to hear what is loud as well as what is so soft as to be almost inaudible. Concepts such as containment and holding, which have served to elaborate the analyst's role as well as that of the primal parent, apply equally to leadership. Can these concepts be seen as specifically feminine? I think they can be as long as feminine is not limited to gender, but evokes the value of conciliation through placing oneself in the service of the other, even if this comes with a cost. Freud's associating this feminine value with masochism missed entirely the growth enhancing attribute that holding provides. It's about love and not suffering. We've all had patients who pushed us to our personal and professional limits. As a result, our goal can become for a while solely to survive, to contain and not retaliate. This might be termed feminine, but it would never be accurate to view it as masochistic, even if there is a price to pay. So in conclusion, my aim is to continue to be a feminine leader, not because I'm a woman, but because I perceive these values and this orientation as central to the analytic method, which is the basis of my ethics and mindset concerning leadership. Ironically, psychoanalysis itself has often been viewed as the dark continent, obscure and impenetrable to view. Does this mean that we, the psychoanalysts, both male and female, are the feminine expression of the talking cure? We are, after all, receptive, introspective, reflective, and creative. If so, it's time to shine a light on our strengths, open up our thinking towards the future, and transcend all the old categories that have overly defined and burdened us. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you for so this so uh, personal, uh, authentic voice and listening. Uh, thank you for the promising approach you propose. Uh, the feminine, the feminine as an important model for leadership. Thank you all for these uh, so uh, uh, original presentations. Three original, very original presentations. And now we will continue with the question answer session and you will have uh, the opportunity to come back to some points our participants would like you to explain more so i will start with the first question the question in the context of 
an intense psychoanalytic treatment. What are the signs that the patient is more in touch with his or her feminine sides? And what is the relationship with the capacity to free associate? Who would like to start? Maybe Rosine, because she get rest, uh, she talk in the bikini. <laughs> Um, I'm just uh, writing the question. I, I can what, I say, do you want me to read it again? No, no, no. I got. I think I got it. I, I just want to. Can I say first how much I enjoyed uh, my colleagues' presentations and uh, Clara's uh, Clara Nemes uh, evo evoking the contribution of Rio da Plata. It's very meaningful to me. Uh, just briefly, because I remember in the in the 60s when we were in Brazil at the time of the dictatorship, when we were reading psychoanalysis and Marxism, uh, the Argentinians were very inspiring to us, and uh, Langer was specifically so. I remember that when we were reading Engels and the origins of uh, private property, uh, the, the idea that once upon a time there was a matriarchy, the idea is that uh, this could find its explanation, Marie Langer talking about the maternal imago, that mm -hmm. yes, that there was a matriarchy. If it hasn't been proven sociologically, it has been proven psychoanalytically, because mm -hmm. once upon a time to all of us, the, it was the reign of matriarchy, isn't it? And I also enjoyed very much Harriet Moore's uh, uh, thoughts, and I wondered if a question for perhaps for the both of you whether uh, there is a link between uh, Clara's notion uh, of feminine power and Harriet's uh, thinking about the feminine in leadership. That perhaps one can talk about this now. In relation to this question, the evidence that the patient is in contact with feminine, I think uh, thinking about what Harriet said at the end of her of her paper, um, I think that there is, uh, there is uh, from its beginnings in terms of the not only the clinical material, but also in the theoretical postulations, a profound link between psychoanalysis and feminine. And, uh, you know, this idea, what is it that it's repudiated? I think it's also, it's the contact of the internal and I think a patient who is a free, a free associating is in contact with his, her interiority, which is the dark continent of the feminine. And that, I think, does link with what Harriet was saying about psychoanalysis itself being the dark continent. So it's, the, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting link, perhaps. There's something else I want to say, but I'll wait a bit. Clara? Yes, I would. I was uh, also associating to the question, not answering to the question, but it made it evoked in me uh, something that Bion says about being so dependent on others and at the same at the same time being so alone that we are alone and at the same time we are very dependent on the others. So this conflict that comes upon the the, the the baby from the very beginning, no, and and it goes with us uh, throughout life. The feeling that we are so dependent, but at the same time that we are alone, that we depend also on somebody who is free to go, free to die, free to live, free to have a life uh, that is not constantly with us. So I think that this may be something that also we have to take into account that it's not only one aspect that is uh, straightforward. We are always in a conflict, we are always in a paradox, even between the male power and, and feminine power, between receptivity and being able to be um, in a way um, not, you know, it, in this kind of receptivity, we receive all the projections, but we are also projecting on our patients, per babies, or, 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 or the people who are, we are with. And this interchange that makes us feel 
somehow that we are going to be used by the other as well as a deposit, but we are also using the other as a deposit. And how does that become a continent? No? How does it become something that is container of all the, the projections? So I think that this kind of this to be this to be there for the other, to be uh, present, to be is a very active thing, but it's also, it also has its conflicts. It's not so straightforward. We are defended against it and we are receptive. And with the other, it happens the same. It may happen now with the audience or with, we, with one another, that one is receptive to what the other says, but one is defended as well, you see. So I think it's a very interesting and nuanced uh, situation. This is receptivity and content and all that. Harriet? I'm afraid I've forgotten the first part of the question, but I would like to um, say something and sort of in response to Ros what Rosina and Clara are saying. The, uh, to hearken back to Vivian Chatrivatine's contributions about the asymmetry in the analytic relationship and the ethical responsibility of the analyst uh, in the face of extreme need. This, remind, this uh, comes to mind with Clara's comments. There's no question that we are in conflict when we are on some level feeling assaulted by need. But we also uh, have a, I think courage is a very wonderful concept to get at how we manage to stay steady in the face of that expression of need. Um, I found uh, Shatriva Teen's focus on the ethical uh, responsibility of the analyst and caretaker for this sort of primal situation of need, which has to do specifically with survival, mm -hmm. as, uh, as orienting, really. And she draws on uh, Levinas, uh, whose ethics, ethics focuses on responsibility for the other. And when I um, read her, I often think of the situation in which a mother has a new baby who will not stop crying and experiences what I suspect is a universal fantasy of throwing that baby out the window. But it doesn't happen. There is something uh, that Scarfoni called in an introduction to Chitripatine's book, Radical Passivity. And by that, I mean the capacity to not respond in kind, to not be reactive, but to just hold the moment, hold the need, and allow another state to emerge, which is then a more of a, you know, a sort of a fundament for an interpersonal sense of value and stability. So I, I, I think the matricial space speaks to the feminine. So I acknowledge we're still caught in a certain binary uh, place in our theoretical history in talking about masculine and feminine, you know, and we are, I think we're all trying to think our way through what is essentially human and how do we help our patients improve and help our organizations improve as well. And that it is also essentially woman to, to woman, <laughs> human. <laughs> the unconscious comes. Uh, yeah. It's also essentially human to feel that one could throw the baby out of the window, or that one could get that would want to get rid of this patient or this situation or whatever. That that's human too, but we have to acknowledge it. No, right. because there we are going to be more careful as well. Exactly. Can I say something? Um, I think perhaps it would take a long time to try to disentangle some words, concepts that we use 
and I, I suppose this is a bit obvious, but I want to, to draw attention to this. I think it's very important to distinguish sex, gender, and sexuality. So when we talk about sex, we are re referring to the anatomical difference between the sexes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when we are talking about gender, we are talking about the way in which culture selects certain attributes in order to, be, to relate them to the difference between the sexes. But sexuality, which is the object of psychoanalysis, is something of a different order. And sexuality, I think, is inaugurated with difference, not differences, it, difference. And I see it, it, it's inaugurated with, and from that perspective, it is binary. I, um, and uh, even if on top, when Freud is talking about the fluidity of identifications in each of his uh, clinical cases, that's why I'm saying also he is perhaps the first queer theoretician. But difference is sexual, and it is inaugurated in Freud with castration, not in, the, in reality in terms of the elimination of the penis, because in reality, as Lacan said, there is no penis missing in a woman. And I, I think that sometimes when one navigates from, uh, from the psychoanalytic discourse, the political discourse, we might be missing what is essentially subversive and transgressive about sexuality. And in that femininity, woman is the other. And you know that all these uh, statements, they, they have a place in the psychoanalytic discourse that's very different from the political discourse. So that's why I think it would take a lot of time to unpack perhaps these different concepts and the way we're using it. Uh, because obviously politically I agree with what, what both of you are saying, but I think in terms of conceptualization, I can't see in what way <clears throat> one can understand the feminine and the masculine without Freud. That's what I wanted to say. I, so. I wanted to, to, to thank you, but uh, you're asking two questions I didn't ask you. I have in front of me. <laughs> the questions and you're asking you're uh answering but i didn't ask you to answer to this question so already harriet and uh, rosina and clara you have uh, answered several questions about uh, passivity about uh, receptivity uh, about the uh, gender fluidity about uh, okay i will fi I find one that you didn't uh, treat it uh, it is addressed to dr perlberg but I think that uh, it concerns all of you. Uh, what about men analysts? Do you mean he wouldn't ever be able to represent mother object forever lost and deal with melancholic longing in the transference? I'll never, I'll have, I'll never say that at all, obviously. Um, you know, and if bisexuality is characteristics of all of us, um, both the male and the female analysts should be able to activate the masculine and the feminine in themselves. But I would find it very difficult to dismiss uh, the, the relevance of the sex of the analyst in an analysis. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, if, if psychically we struggle, struggle with different elements, which is one's own capacity for receptivity, for instance, uh, or that includes so many different things because sometimes the material of a patient may touch us something that's deeply psychic in our way of experiencing the world, sometimes our shortcomings and blind spots and so on. Uh, but I, I do wonder, and I don't think there's an answer for that, but I do think that the sex of the analysts will have an impact uh, in what goes on in the diet. Thank you. Harriet or uh, Clara? I'm I am I'm afraid that if we go on discussing among us, we don't have time for the questions, okay. but it's a very interesting 
uh, dialogue that we may have because yes. uh, I, I I agree I, I think and I think that we also have to be very careful about what uh, Rosine first said about the political and the social pressures we have as psychoanalysts no and yesterday we were having a short inter exchange and we were saying that we are all always old-fashioned in relation to what's going on in the society because now I see uh um young people wearing t-shirts in which it, they say genderless genderless so it's another development <laughs> but I, I and i think that we are offering some something which is very different from other post uh, other situations in in politics and in society which is the time to reflect and not to react no so that that is very interesting i think uh as a side uh, answer in relation to men and and women i think also that it is important at least at the beginning of the of the treatment and the way in when in, when in a supervision a woman analyst describes the patient in detail about some of the you know uh, characteristics and and what they wear and, and how they look like it's very interesting that the approach to the patient, to the person in the patient, it's somehow a little bit different. They take into account more the aspect and the non-verbal communication of the patient. But I think that as the transference develops, this is less and less uh, important in the work, you know, that some sometimes the patient even you if you are a woman he will or she will feel that your interpretation is you know going into and other times it will be more containing and other times it will depend also on the way that each analyst um works through these identifications with the oedipal identifications with the active mother or with the passive father for instance harriet I think um, a couple things. Um, I think Rosine's uh, proposition that it that the that the I guess it's the sex. But I, am I saying that right? It's the sex of the um, analyst that makes a difference. Is um, challenges our uh, sense of ourselves as psychoanalysts. I think we hope to be um, as available to male patients and female patients um, as possible. So I, I, I find it very challenging and I, I wish we could explore it further. Um, and I, I appreciate the uh, statement that psychoanalysis is addressing issues on a different level. The T-shirt that says genderless, I'm familiar with, you know, such things in North America, candidates or graduate analysts are saying, we should take gender off the standards for education of new psychoanalysts. It doesn't matter if they say a male and a female, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, I think it matters, but the challenge for us as, as psychoanalysts is to explain why. And I think this uh, event today has uh, a beginning for me, uh, a new beginning for thinking through what psychoanalysis has to offer. I've already been thinking on a more um, sociocultural level that psychoanalysis has never been more needed in our troubled world, uh, despite the fact it's constantly under fire. I think this, uh, this aspect of what we have to offer as a field and what we have to offer as analysts for both male and female, for both male and female patients is a very interesting question. I, I wish, I hope we can discuss it further. And I suppose July will be another opportunity when we look at the feminine. Because I have, as you no doubt do as well, male colleagues who feel um, very in touch with the feminine within them. And I think, uh, feel open to the sorts of transferences Rosine describes, but maybe more 
prominent or deeper in with a female analyst? That's a very challenging question, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose, you know, what comes to mind, uh, you see, it's something about, we're talking now again about uh, uh, sex and gender, because um, uh, a lot of the literature, um, what comes to my mind, for instance, is the writings of Joyce McDougall following Freud when, he said, when she suggests the trauma of the discovery of the differences between the sexes. And you may be reminded, uh, you may remember that example that she gives of this five-year-old boy who arrives very excited in a session saying, Joyce, Joyce, during the holidays, the children went to swim naked. And uh, Joyce McDougall can't stop herself and she reacts, what do you mean, boys and girls? And the boy reacts, don't be stupid. I just told you, we we're all naked. How can I tell? <laughs> and I think the illustration, and I think it's it's uh, the trauma of the discovery of the differences between the sexes, and I suppose it's a working idea, hypothesis that I have, um, anyway, to address the issue of the difference. Hmm. Okay, uh, I will I will give you another question, not uh, very far. Could you elaborate upon the effect of a female analyst on what is experienced in the session? You have already talked a bit, but uh, it is asking to... The ethics of the... The effect of a female analyst on what is experienced in the session. I'll say something about that. Having having raised ethical considerations, it's hard to know from the question what the person may have in mind. But what it brings to my mind is uh, the the presence in any lively analysis of an erotic transference. Mm -hmm. And I think the ethic of the analyst, it's not just the woman analyst, but any analyst is to um, be aware of uh, that, that set of feelings and again, to hold them without acting on them. And that's the ethical stance uh, that's required, I think, I think by the asymmetric uh, responsibility. Um, I brought up the ethical stance of the analyst uh, alluding to Shatri Bhatin's book, on the, what she calls the ethical seduction of the analytic situation. Introducing the idea that when we invite someone into treatment as a psychoanalyst, we're inviting them into a situation in which all sorts of feelings are aroused. And we, um, in our matricial space, make that possible and then don't act, uh, don't act on the feelings that are stirred up. So that's my sense of what the ethical stance of the analyst is. Okay. I shall go on. I will continue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It seems to be two meanings in which term feminine is used in contemporary IPA. Let, first, let me call it metapsychological as some psychic capacity or quality. And second, empirical uh, as something about women. Could you please comment on this? Mm -hmm. Could, would, you be so, would you repeat that, Eliana? Yes. Um, it seems to be two meanings in which term feminine is used in contemporary IPA. First, let me, let me call it metapsychological as some psychic capacity or quality. And secondly, empirical as something about women. Could you please comment on this? But I, I suppose each of us has indicated the multifaceted, even if there are different emphasis, I suppose, in the three short papers, 
uh, what is what is uh, common perhaps is is the multifaceted way in which the feminine is is thought about isn't it i think from the from the pre the, from the feminine in the mother to the feminine in the infant, the feminine in women, the feminine in men, uh, the, the feminine of the analytic encounter, because I think in a way that's what Harriet was referring to in a way. There is something about the feminine and the masculine of the setting, the way in which the setting itself, uh, when in the process of receiving a patient, is offering something like a maternal womb or in the interiority of the mother's body, as well as when, when the analyst formulates an interpretation, you have perhaps a more masculine kind of activity. So I, I would not think that the only two ways in which we're using the feminine, we're actually showing how problematic and interesting and rich uh, mm. uh, the feminine that Monique Cornu talks about, which is the sex of the, the of the of the feminine of the woman's body, so I, I think it's it's uh, very heterogeneous the ways in which we talk about. But I also think it's a very interesting question because it it deals with what happens when one uses a, the a, a word that it's a common language word, and we have to deal with the concept. So each time we try to discuss something, we are discussing actually the basic psychoanalytic concepts, you know, even about metapsychology. Mm -hmm. Is metapsychology still, no, some, some people ask, is still metapsychology something that we take into account, even if it sounds strange? So I think it is interesting, are we defining a psychoanalytic concept when we talk about the feminine or are we defining a quality which is would we be would be different no i think but it's an interesting question because i think that this is the problem we face each time we have to talk about a psychoanalytic concept but we use common day language uh, words mm. okay. Yes, uh, I would like to read you another question. We are in a moment of change about the concept of the feminine, both culturally and in academic discourses, mainly in feminist discourses, with the new ways of being a woman, speaking in particular of trans women. In what way can the feminine in psychoanalysis reach these dissident identities? I would like to make a parenthesis and say that uh, I should have said uh, in the beginning that everybody is responsible for these ideas and for his uh, the way of uh, thinking and presenting his ideas uh, during the webinar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is that a, facing is that... the consequences. Do you, want, do you want me to read again the question? Yes. Sure. Uh, we are in a moment of change about the concept of the feminine, both culturally and in academic discourses, mainly in feminist discourses, with the new ways of being a woman, speaking in particular of trans women. In what way can the feminine in psychoanalysis reach these dissident identities? Can I perhaps start with this, starting from what Clara's point previously, the point Clara made, which I thought was very important, because I suppose if I were to characterize my short statement, I am dealing with the feminine from a meta-psychological point of view. Um, and I think what is very important, you know, I'm in I teach at the university, so I'm all the time in conversation with young students. Um, that what, in a way, what what the analyst can say can be very uh, re restrict, although it has wider implications, because what we're dealing is with the unconscious. We're dealing with unconscious material. And what is very interesting is the recurrence of the realm of unconscious fantasies 
perhaps in spite of the variety of, of systems in which people live. So I will still have patients in my practice who have dreams that express the terror of the body of a woman. We still deal with patients, men, patients who are impotent, perhaps because there is a, a terror of penetrating the body of a woman. We still have patients who, women who suffer from frigidity because they're terrified of being penetrated. So some of these invariants belong to the unconscious domain. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, Freud says that there is a limited amount of symbols. There, it is, and Jones also developed this, isn't it? The, the limited number of, th of stuff, I suppose, that can be symbolized that's to do with birth, death, uh, the, the birth of a sibling, the maternal body, the primal scene. And how is it that this material emerges in an analysis? And they can be at, uh, th there may be a disjunction, and I think there is a disjunction between that at one, at what, and what one does in daily life in the external world. And I think it's very important all the time to delineate what is, what is our raw material, what is it that we deal with, in our practice as psychoanalysts, I would like I would like to go on Can I, uh, and I, ask a question to Harriet. I was going to. Can I speak to this question for a okay. moment? Um, I I was approaching in my paper the thought of feminine as related to leadership with the idea in mind. I wonder uh, what. Uh, my colleagues think about this, with the idea in mind expressed by an American analyst who's also a feminist, who's uh, since passed away, Muriel Diamond. She yeah. felt there was a fundamental interrelationship between psychoanalytic, social, and feminist theory. And I, I, um, I thought when I heard the question that it, it reminded me of uh, the, the problem of conflating feminine and female. And if we're working with trans patients who have become female or female who have become male, we have, I think, an unusual opportunity to learn more about how, um, from their point of view, uh, sex and gender and uh, their place in the world has, has gathered meaning. So it's a it's a actually a wonderful opportunity for us to develop our theories further. I just didn't want to conflate feminine and female if we can avoid it. Okay. So there is, a, there is a question. There is a question for Harriet. Yeah. So uh, we all know how boys and girls seduce the mother to get her to do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What kind of attitude may a feminine leader need to take to find the balance between listening and taking decisions? <laughs> well, the, there's, there's a question that answers it. It's uh, finding that balance between thinking and taking action. And uh, probably, you know, the, the word that has come up this morning or this afternoon for most people is uh, courage. But I um, also call it, uh, in Bionian terms, containment and holding. So that, I think, it's actually the love in the mother's or parent's heart that, uh, and not suffering, that maintains the sort of stance of um, vital neutrality. You know, that's another term that's gone bad. People think of neutrality as being a feelingless when it's not that at all. It's exactly what I'm talking about in terms of holding the, uh, the chaotic request uh, from any child that's uh, um, seductive on the one hand and completely annoying on the other, and kind of managing that with a light hand and um, patience and endurance and courage to know that it's gonna be, it's gonna evolve in a way that will allow the uh, child to become more of a person. Uh, Clara, in her paper, uh, I think, alluded to um, the mother letting go, the mother 
being able to uh, stand with such a display and have some confidence that uh, perhaps through the relationship or perhaps through the, uh, the, uh, the strengths of the child, the development will continue along a um, positive course. Uh, we, we have, have only have one time? minute. Do we have time? We don't have time. We don't okay. have time. We have okay. only one more minute. And I would like to, to thank you. Thank you very much for this so uh, authentic and original uh, way to present the feminine. Our next webinar is in a month and it will be on research. It will be on the unconscious id. Our guests will be Mark Solms, David Tackett, and Ricardo Lombardi. So, Saturday on April. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions and for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.